Welcome to Accounting with Audra. In this video on intermediate accounting topics, we're going to discuss basic concepts of bond accounting, how to value bonds, generalize their entries, and prepare an amortization table. Bonds are a unique investment vehicle whereby an investor lends money to a company or government for a set period of time in exchange for regular interest payments for a set period. There are a variety of types of bonds, most of which are labeled for their various features. In this video, I am going to explain how to account for a bond on the financial statements. We use the key terms of face amount, stated interest, and market interest to determine the present value of bonds, journalize them, as well as prepare an amortization schedule to support the value of the bonds as recorded. This video will specifically focus on recording bonds at a discount. Although the steps are always the same, additional videos will illustrate bonds that are issued at a premium, zero coupon bonds, and bonds that are sold at par value. Bonds are different from typical loans because they are essentially traded in the market. Market drivers determine what an appropriate interest rate is. Unfortunately, the interest rate determined for bonds is set in stone when the initial bonds are documented and sold on paper. As a result, the market rate of the interest may be different from the rate of interest stated on the bond itself, based on when the investor buys that bond. The difference between the market, what the market believes is appropriate interest versus the stated amount causes the actual price of the bond itself to change. When a company chooses to issue bonds to raise funds, they usually do so in $1,000 increments. So for example, if we have a 2% bond, when market interest rates are 6%, that bond will be in low demand and priced lower as interest rates are closer to the bond stated rate of 2%, that's when the bond would be valued closer to 1,000. So as interest rates go up, this bond would be cheaper and cheaper. In this instance, for example, $700. On the flip side, if we had a 5% bond and market interest rates were only 2%, then that bond will be in high demand and cost more because the rate of interest you can get on it is much higher than if you invested on something else in the market. So in this instance, we're showing a 5% bond at $1,000 as the original purchase. If interest rates are higher, it would be cheaper, but if interest rates are lower, this bond would sell for more. In other words, an investor that may wish to pay more or less than the $1,000 face amount of the bond if it believes interest rates is better than or not as good as the market. The difference in face maturity amount in the purchase price creates a premium or discount. So for example, if we have a five-year $600,000 bond, so interest will be paid semi-annually. So in this bond, interest is gonna be paid to the investor twice a year. The stated interest rate on the example we're gonna do is 4%, and the market interest rate at the time these bonds are purchased is 6%. So in other words, the market interest rate is greater than the stated rate. Whenever this happens, these bonds are sold at a discount because if you were to invest elsewhere in the market, you would technically make more on your money. So they have to lower the cost of the bonds, encourage investors to invest in these bonds. Pricing of the bond equals the present value of the maturity amount. So the thousand dollars generally is how they're priced, plus the present value of stated interest payments. So to figure out our premium or discount, we need to determine the present value of the maturity and the stated interest payments. So we would need to pull present value tables. The present value of the maturity value is gonna be determined using present value of a dollar, the table on the left, and stated interest payments, because these are annuity payments made over the life of the bond, the present value will be determined using the present value of an annuity table. If we look again at an example, we have a 4% stated rate, a 6% market rate. When determining the present value of the bonds, we always use the market interest rate, which is how that drives a difference in price relative to the stated rate. Looking at present value tables, we need to know N, our period of time, and I, the relative interest rate. Because these bonds are semi-annual, paid out twice a year, N is not going to be five or five years, but five times two, 10. And our interest rate will be 3%, the 6% divided by two to represent six month period of time. Looking at our present value tables, this would give us a present value of a dollar of 0.744 and our present value of an annuity factor of 8.53. So we'll use this to determine the present value of the notes as we move forward. 
looking at the present value of our face amount or our maturity amount, remember those terms are synonymous, we would take the $600,000 of the bond times 0 0.7744, which gives us 446,456. To determine the present value of our stated interest payments, first we have to determine the actual interest payment value. Our interest payment is going to be the $600,000 of our bond times our 4% stated interest rate divided by two, or $12,000. So every six months, the investor would get a $12,000 interest payment on this bond for investing, because that's the stated rate. The present value of those payments is going to be taken by our present value factor of 8.530, which gives us a present value of 102,362. If we add these two values together, our total present value of our bond is $548,818. A quick check on bonds. If you're selling a bond at a discount, which we've determined based on interest rates, right? Again, stated rate is less than a market rate. Then when we do our present values, if we've done them correctly, the present value of our bond should also be less than the maturity value or 600,000. So just a quick, um, Sanity check when you're looking at these problems. If you got something larger than 600,000, then you know you're using the wrong present value factors. So as we move forward in our bond, again, um, we're looking at the fact that the present value is 548,818. So that's actually what the investor is going to pay for the bond, not 600,000, but something less because these bonds are sold at a discount. In return, they'll get $12,000 of interest every six months for five years. And at the end of the five-year investment, they'll get not 548818 back, but they'll get 600,000 back, the maturity value, which is why when companies account for these bonds, they need to record a payable for the full 600,000 because that's what they're gonna pay at the end of the day. So they invest in this instance, 548,000, and they make $720,000 on that return over the period of five years. So let's start working on our journal entries. At issuance of this bond, the company who has these bonds outstanding to investors will receive cash of 548818 the value of the bond that we've calculated. They will credit the bond payable for the full maturity value of 600,000. The difference between those two is a plug. When that plug is a debit, it's a discount. And in this case, our discount comes to 51,182. If when we were doing our math, we had a premium, our premium would be plugged as a credit. Then on each payment that we make, the company will debit interest expense, but the interest expense they're gonna debit is the balance of the note times the market interest rate. So not the stated rate, but the market rate. The balance of the note is what is on the balance sheet, net of premium or discount. So on day one, our balance would be 548818. The cash amount that's going to be credited is always the stated interest payment. So you'll find that every journal entry we do for this problem, the credit to cash will be exactly the same amount, the stated interest amount of 12,000. And then finally, the difference between the effective interest expense and the cash will be a credit to discount on bonds payable. This is our plug. We always know it's a credit when it's a discount because the idea is that eventually, if we do all our journal entries right, the initial discount of 51,182 at the end of five years will go to zero. Okay, so in our example, let's go ahead with numbers and do the first payment. So we're gonna debit interest expense using our initial balance times our effective, our market interest rate of 6% times six over 12, because we're doing this in six months, which gives us $16,465. Our credit to cash is our state, stated interest that we've already computed to do present value, that's 12,000. And then our discount on bond payable is a plug, 4,465. So it's what gets our debits and credits to balance from a journal entry standpoint. Let's go ahead and work through an amortization schedule so we could see how this bond flows out through the entire time. So when you're setting up your amortization table in Excel, you always have your payment. Now, I always say number, so we know we need 10 payments. So that's why I have payment in the first column. The date of our payments, the stated interest rate, 
In this case, 2% is one half of 4% for six months. The effective interest is your balance times your effective interest rate because again, we're semi-annual. I'm using 3%, not 6%. Our discount and then the balance amount that we've recorded to start. So when we did our original present value, we determined our balance of 548 and our discount. And then we're gonna go ahead and do our amortization schedule and see how that ties to our initial journal entry. An amortization schedule, once set up, will determine all of your journal entries for the life of the bond. So my payments and my dates have gone ahead and filled out. We're gonna assume this bond started on the 1st of 2021. And so our first payment will occur on June 30th. And that first payment will be our stated rate of 12,000. Our effective interest, which again is the balance we have, times our market interest rate for six months. And then the difference between those two is our plug. When we get our plug with, it's a discount, we're gonna decrease that discount eventually down to zero, which is why the 4465 on our AMORT schedule is a negative. What that also does is our total balance increases and is gonna come up to 600,000. So as the discount goes down, the net balance on the balance sheet will go up for a discount. So now our net balance will be 553,283. So if you were to add up the 51, 181, minus 4465 plus 553,283, you should get 600,000 as a check. Your number should always tie to 600,000. Let's go ahead and do all of our stated interest rates. And the nice part is those are constant, 12,000. If you'd like for practice, I would suggest at this point, pausing the video and taking a second to see if you can determine some of the next payments on your own um, to master this information. I'm gonna go ahead and continue on, but if, okay, moving forward. Our new balance is 553,283, so times our 3% is going to give us a new interest amount on the second payment, December 31st, of 16,599. The difference between the 12,000 and that 16,599 is a plug of 4,599. And our balance will increase by that 4,599. So the new balance is 557. 882. If we were to finish out this amortization schedule, if you do it in Excel, once you have your formula set up, you should be able to copy them down pretty quickly. What you should see at the end of the day is after 10 payments, your total balance is 600,000. So my stated interest rate is my 12,000 times 10 or 120,000 of interest. And my final balance on the balance sheet should be 600,000. So when I go to my balance sheet, I should have zero discount left and only a bond payable of 600,000. And if you wanna do a quick check, you can add up everything in the discount column and you should get to zero at the end of the day. The investor will get the 120,000 of interest plus the 600,000 that gets us back to 720. Okay, so let's take this table. I'm gonna shrink it up a little bit and do our journal entries referring to the table. So if we keep moving forward on 1231-2021 for our second interest payment, now we can use our table. Debit interest expense for the 16,599, credit cash for 12,000, and credit our discount on bonds payable for the plug of 4599. So we can always refer to this table now to quickly do the rest of our calculations. Let's do one more, June 30th, 2022. Using our table, our market interest rate, our interest expense is 16,736. Again, our cash is 12,000 and our plug to discount on bonds payable is 4,736. And we would make these journal entries every six months at the company until we get to maturity. Our last journal entry after all of these at 1231-2025 would of course include our last payment of interest. So in this case, 17,825 our cash and our discount 5825. Um, if you have a, a small rounding issue, you would just take the discount down to zero. And then as the investor gets their cash back from their investment in a company, we would debit bond payable to remove the entire $600,000 payable, credit cash of $600,000. And there would be nothing left on the balance sheet with respect to this investment. A few things to just additionally add 
as we talk about our discount on bonds, and some of this is relevant to all bonds. Um, if a company chooses straight line method, what does that mean? That just means that instead of having different interest expense amounts every single payment based on the balance, you take the entire discount or premium, divide it by the number of payments, the same effective interest rate the entire way down. So you actually have the same journal entry and your plug and your market interest rate don't change quarter over quarter, but you still get down to zero. It's a simplistic method, um, but you have to make sure it does not have a material impact on the financials if you're gonna use it. The other thing is early debt extinguishment. Sometimes bonds are called early or extinguished early. If that's the case, usually what happens is you have to take both the discount and the bond off the balance sheet. So you would, in this case, um, debit the bond and you would credit the discount for whatever is on the balance sheet. And then there's always an extinguishment price. So you would also record the extinguishment price, which is what you're paying the investor, and that's a credit to cash. And then the plug between all of that is a gain or a loss on extinguishment to that bond. And finally, bonds that are sold on par value, I'm not gonna do a separate video because really what those mean is the stated rate equals the market rate. So there's no discount or premium recorded. Journal entries are simply always a debit to interest expense, which happens to be the same as stated rate, and a credit to cash. As always, if you like the information discussed in this video and you would like to receive updates when new videos are posted, please consider subscribing.